the topic of reptiles, mm. to each of you, would you rather that I have to fight a Komodo dragon with a spear or an eight-year-old that you do not know has to fight a rattlesnake with their bare hands? Do I get to watch the eight-year-old fight the rattlesnake? Nope, you just know that it is happening somewhere. I don't get to watch it? Do I get to watch either of them? Like you fighting okay, a spear? I, okay, sounds like you want to watch yes, it. That's, that's, I think <laughs> well, that's the end. That's the if I'm deciding here. Already, this. this isn't the direction I thought it was going in. I thought you'd be horrified at well, this Well, it kind of like, sounds no. like we're standing on a wall and I can either kick the eight-year-old into the pit with the snake or you to the Komodo dragon and toss you a spear. Yeah, that's I, it sounds like the scenario I'm in. So sure. I just want to know. This is the Spartac situation yeah, that we're in yeah, right now. Yeah, but you're responsible for whichever eventuality. Eight-year-old. Yeah, I think I'd go with the eight-year-old. You'd rather an eight-year-old that you don't know has to fight a rattlesnake. Yes, because I know hands. you. Yeah. Well, that's not my reason. I just, kids and me just don't get along. Well, I'm, I'm like, I did not think that was going to be the answer. So I'm like, well, thank you both for. Now wait. Now what's the reason that you chose that? Was that because you, you're Do happy? Do you assume he's going to lose? Like, is that why? <laughs> Because you think the eight year old's the only one that might well, win. Well, it depends the eight year old you're sending. Because I know a bunch, well, not personally, but know of eight year olds who know how to handle a rattlesnake. Oh, eight year olds so, are annoying. So, like, they're capable, well. but a Komodo dragon, if it wants to fuck you up, whether you have a spear or not, you're done. So I would give a better chance to the eight-year-old against the snake than Terry and the Komodo dragon. Is this dragon. a regular Komodo dragon, or is this like a fantasy size? Adam's Komodo fuming dragon. that this is going on way too long. <laughs> oh, you can cut it off at any point you want. This is the post credit too. I survive. It's a mimic, the roundtable Dungeons and Dragons discussion, where you never know what you're going to get. in our conversation on playable races. I'm Megan, and with me today are James and Terry, who I haven't seen in forever. So, hello, hello. And this episode is called Kobolds, Lizard Folk, and Yuan-T Purebloods, A Million Reptilian Civilians. Oh, wow. Fuck they're getting, you, they're Adam. Getting, oh, there was one the other day, which of course I forget, which was a nightmare for me to get out. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go find that one. Oh, man. In our conversation about playable races in D&D 5th edition, we've already covered three kinds of dwarves, three kinds of halflings, and three kinds of gnomes. We dedicated two episodes to six kinds of elves, assuming you don't split hairs with the Eladrin. We've done half-elves, half-orcs, and the 95,000 kinds of humans in Forgotten Realms. And of course, we dedicated full episodes to tieflings, dragonborn, aracocra, ASMR, and Janassi. Oh man, that's a mouthful. You can find all these episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and dozens of other podcast apps, or you can jump over to YouTube and dig into the entire playlist called Off to the Races that we've built there. This episode of the It's a Myth podcast is going to crack open Volo's Guide to Monsters and see what 5th edition has to bring to the table when it comes to some the reptilian playable races. Okay, so kobolds aren't strictly reptilian, but they're definitely a step further away from the dragons than dragonborn are. And we know from previous editions that kobolds shed their skin like other reptiles and are cold-blooded. So this panel of Dungeon Masters is counting them as being just as reptilian as lizard folk and Yuan-Ti purebloods. Today's episode is going to focus on these playable races from a player perspective. So if you'd like to deep dive into each of these races, we've covered kobolds in depth in episode 50 and 106, lizard folk in episode 112, and Yuanti in episodes 113 and episode 114. These episodes are all available on your podcast apps or YouTube page as well. I'm eager to look at these creatures one more time, but before we get started, James, Terry, it's because it says host two and host three. <laughs> right. For everyone at home, it says host two and host three in the notes. And Megan visibly <laughs> forgot who was who. Like, and then full on forgot my name. I did. <laughs> she remembered my name, though. And that's the you important did. part. What experiences do you have with Cobalt, Lizard Folk, and Yuanti and Dungeons and Dragons? Played Yanti with uh, Terry in that campaign. You played. Um, I was a, your a dragonborn, green dragonborn, right? yeah. Slythe, I think it was. Slythe Skinner. Uh, oh, God. But that's really my only experience. Most DMs I've played with have never put us up against most of these races. Maybe kobolds once or twice, but they usually put us up against bigger things to fight. I feel like kobolds are like that weird classic thing that you played when you started out on yeah. D&D, and then any DM who's played for more than a few years stops using them. Yeah. So. Yeah. Adam's quite multiracial in his games. He likes to throw in lots of different races. I've played with kobold NPCs and lizard folk NPCs with Adam. And then played next to, yeah, that's right, James, when you were Yonti Sorcerer. 
Yeah, so that's right. And I was a dragonborn uh, druid next to you, and that was a that was a lot of fun because yeah. that, that was my first experience playing uh, alongside Yuanti. So that was great. Yeah, that was a fun campaign. Yeah, we currently have a Yuanti cult in ours that were as NPCs. Oh, fun. nice. Yeah. So and can they're... I join? I feel like <laughs> can I join the cult, please? Would, love it. would you like to be a part of the cult or just in the game? Both. <laughs> just the cult. The, the cult. answer is perhaps yes. Um, so have you guys experienced them as uh, players at the table before? I've never played any of these races as a player. I mean, you said character. you did a Yuan Yeah, I did a Yuan and that's about it so far. But, uh, yeah, Terry, you haven't played. No, Yuan is going to be next, I think. Or maybe Lizard Folk after diving into this. I haven't we'll really see. looked into it, so yeah, we'll see what I'm told about it tonight. But I do Yuan again. I've done it before. Mm-hmm. I've actually kept that character since that campaign kind of fizzled out and I, when I'm in one shot, so I'll generally bring him along. And you mm-hmm. emphasize the A in the first part, not the U. I say Yuan yeah. You're like Yuan yeah that's fine whatever i don't know if it's <laughs> your british english and my canadian english but i've also been told i have an accent for a canadian even so oh do you really i've been told that i don't hear it but right right you never hear your own accent i think there really. is a canadian accent i noticed yeah. this uh i was watching i was watching tiktok the other day and they pointed out that <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was the so don't, don't do this anymore okay <laughs> All right, so we're actually going to get right into it. So um, we're going to roll dice, and then we're going to decide who gets to go over their playable race first. Four. Twelve. Fifteen. James, you See get you to go first. Okay. So as happenstance would have it, I am doing the auntie. Of course. Since we've already gone over a lot of it in other episodes, I'm just going to do a quick dive into it. They're one of the most ancient human races that were tricked by old gods or... Maybe not tricked, more coerced in continuing down their path. They were big on conquering their enemies and enslaving the ones they beat and then allowing the others to live their lives with their leaders, but they have to follow their gods. So more sacrifices and more gifts and gold and glitter were sent back to the main home cities. Eventually a bunch of strife came about, bad things happened, and they retreated to their home cities. And within weeks the Yonti were gone from the surface. And then a few centuries later, after the old empires fell, they're now working their way back. Hmm. So there's a Yount here done in a caste system from the highest to the lowest. And the purebloods are relatively low on the scale because they look human. They want to look as close to their gods as possible, which are snakes. And the purebloods don't. The purebloods are generally used for infiltration of human societies to get into government, get into positions of power and take over that way. This sounds awesome. Oh, they're an amazing race. I yeah. really enjoy it. Mm. The whole race as a whole has separated themselves from their emotions, so they're much more of a neutral evil race in general. Mm. And you can be born a pure blood, but raise yourself up to higher ranks through rituals and sacrifice. But they're very complicated and very costly, so it's rarely done. So because of your, as a pure blood, because you want to infiltrate things, you get a plus two to charisma and a plus one to intelligence. You get dark vision, which is one of the races I actually understand having dark vision because they're from underground. That's a hot button topic for a few. But Very yeah. hot button topic. As I said, they're neutral evil. Um, you get innate magic casting. So you get acid splash, I believe, or poison spray right off the bat. At third level, you can cast suggestion. A long rest to re-get it back like most other things. If you're not playing a sorcerer to cast these spells, your charisma is still your casting modifier. So that's why Yantis fit as sorcerers really well as player characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have resistance against saving throws against magic magic and magical effects. You're immune to poison, which is really handy. You can speak common, abyssal, and draconic. You're about the same size as a human. You live about just as long as humans do. Oh, and you can also cast Animal Friendship, but it's only limited to snakes. Oh, so you can make friends with animals. You can make just, friends with just, just snakes. That's it. You that's get parcels That's all you get. <laughs> you get to be Salazar Slytherin. Really. Because oh. all Harry Potter wizards are sorcerers, and that's a different story. Oh, okay. I, we, I feel like we've talked yeah. about this many times already. <laughs> Terry's never seen Harry Potter? <sighs> no, nobody in the UK gives a fuck about Harry Potter. <laughs> nobody... Only Harry people Potter. in North America care about this. Sorry, say it one more time. Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> that was the yeah, end. Great. You're like, I don't understand it. <laughs> all right. Is that all you have in your little breakdown? Yeah. Fantastic. So we're gonna add <laughs> your little breakdown. Little breakdown. <laughs> That's all you have in your little, little breakdown. breakdown. Wow. Fantastic. Condescending older it's sister not keeping us in line. I'm trying to be the parent here. You told me to try, and I'm trying. <laughs> 
All right, so I'm going to roll some dice. I'm going to ask some questions about this guy, okay? All right. Should we roll first before we Let's roll first. Uh, I got a 19. I knocked yours, Megan, and you got a 5 okay. again. I love that for me. James, you got a 13. I did. Telling the people at home this is an audio medium. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we should probably. What did you roll? <laughs> Just kidding. All right, so what is one interesting reason why one of these creatures would become an adventurer? So what's a good reason for that? Um, there are a few reasons to gain the necessary ingredients for a ritual to get power would be the number one. Mm -hmm. And a number two really good reason would be to infiltrate an adventurer party to get them to take out an enemy camp, take out a leader of a neighboring city they want to take over, and let them do the auntie's dirty work pretending to be heroes. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That checks out. What about you, Terry? Uh, I see. I think I, so I'm leaning towards the pure bloods, right? So I yeah. think infiltration is a reason that they would join um, uh, an adventuring party and, and mostly to learn as much as they can about other races and how they operate in different situations for like an eventual goal, like a long term goal. So you can get a whole campaign of them being here for that reason, but the backstory would be that they're essentially gathering information on as many races as they can. Mm, I like that. Um, I don't know. I enjoy the idea of it just being like a lost little snake. <laughs> just looking for friends. A lost little snake. That'd be the op that'd be the exact opposite of the way we we're doing, suggesting it, which is it would be also a fun way to play. Like you just either lost your whole family because they're generally born in clutches. So, exactly. Right? An egg just kind of dropped when the clutch was moving, and you just got born yeah, in the and world. And you have no or, idea what the connotations of yeah. being a you want to. Yeah, you don't know with. really what you are. Some people just get stuck in a rut, right? They yeah. just get stuck with things, and they don't know why they're doing it. You know? Yeah. Want to make changes? In It'd their be a fun life, way to know? play Change it too. Life, and then yeah. you don't necessarily have to play them neutral evil in that sense too because yeah maybe neutral good yeah i just keep it around neutral still because yeah. you, you're not selfish. connected to your emotions like racially per se so <laughs> <laughs> it may just be depression right but <laughs> just depressed <laughs> all right well that being said what kind of insights do we have on if players want to explore the role-playing side of things how would we role play this out Infiltration mainly. So you would want to, as uh, the way I was playing it in our campaign, because that's exactly what I was trying to do, was Terry said, learn from other races for an mm -hmm. end goal, is ingratiate yourself to them. Make friends with powerful allies. Have them want to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As opposed to just trying to get just information from them. Make them care about you. Mm -hmm. Like Slythe, I made really good friends with him. You did. I'd, I'd make, I'd play Yuan T because I feel like they would be quite an arrogant race, but uh, where they're they're useful enough that everyone else needs them around, but they're not so uh, arrogant that they make themselves an enemy. So I don't know if it would be condescending, but uh, just frustrating to be around, but invaluable still to the group. Which is like every character I've ever played. Yeah. As I think back, as I think back, I'm like, like that's was. basically every character I've that's ever played. That's a how does Terry role play I think this characters. Terry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I do like the idea that you would play it as if it was very good at one thing. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. this is the talent that this character has. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you want to really play deeply into that just because of a their racial like constraints. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I think that's a good thing to lean on and just play that up and be like, oh, you need this done. I can do that. I yeah. got it. Everything else you're talking about, no. But nobody else can do what I can do. If exactly. you do it better than me, I will hurt yeah. you. And that's, called, <laughs> and that's called being a specialist. Okay? <laughs> oh, dear. All right, so it, it, with all this in mind, what class or subclass would be a good thematic fit for this race and why? Shadow Sorcerer, hands down. Yeah? The Shadow Sorcerer is already the, I come from the darkness about death, and Yanti are about using the death of others to their gods. Mm -hmm. And usually when you're infiltrating someone, you're either looking to get someone dead, or looking to prevent someone from getting dead. So it fits thematically, and Yanti is a sorcerer, they thematically fit. Mm -hmm. They're just innate spell casting, which they already get as a race, and sorcerer is kind of, you become an innate spell caster, you can just... Mm -hmm. cast magic mm -hmm. so it's a real interesting way to play them i'd try and make it work with a bard uh because i'd want to manipulate people that i'd lean into that that uh, political kind of intrigue side especially within within the group so anything that um where uh where anything heavily charisma based where i can it can cause a lot of manipulation but lean into the role-playing pillar of the game which is what i really enjoy uh, that's where I'd go. So Bard. I'd do Bard. I'm imagining, what is it, Shere Khan with the, in mm -hmm. the eyes and the yeah. hypnotism? No, that's, 
Or is that, Ka. or I'm thinking Ka. Yeah. yeah. Shere Khan, which one is Shere Khan? The tiger. The tiger, the tiger? yeah. Okay, so Ka Shere is Shere Khan. The tiger. Okay, sorry. Uh, but yeah, that's what I imagined when you were talking, was mm -hmm. the hypnotism mm -hmm. eyes yeah. of the snake. Incidentally, the voice that plays Ka is also the voice that plays Hiss the snake in Robin Hood. Whatever. Huh. You know that. I think now I'm like, that's not true. <laughs> Someone will fact check Somebody you. Fact -check Somebody this. fact check that. And tell me if I'm wrong. Not that I'll read it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I, 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 I like playing into the magic side of these things. I would want to go either full on just warlock, just darkness, evilness, mm -hmm. necromancer, bringing shit back to life. Yeah. Oh, necromancer would be good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that'd be a lot of fun because it plays into the whole like birth and real life and cycles of a stake. Like, yeah, yeah. I just feel like it kind of fits thematically with them, but I also like the idea of doing a dark and sinister paladin, just because I love paladins. Oh, I could this. work with that. Yeah, this is versatile. Even a cleric. It's a very versatile race. Yeah, but yeah. that plays into the charisma side of it if you go with the paladin yeah. side. Yeah, that's right. So okay. yeah, paladin, sorcerer, and bard would be the three that kind of use the charisma more wisely, but. Once again, like, this is D&D. &D. You can play whatever you want. I do like the paladin idea. The paladin would be fun. Paladin. It'd be interesting. I've never done a paladin, and to do it, that dark paladin would be just too on brand for me, though. For you as a person? Yeah, for me okay. as a person. That'd be what I would, if I had to play a paladin, that's what I would mm. inevitably choose. So mm -hmm. I would want to do something different. Okay, I feel that. Uh, speaking of that, do we have any um, creative builds that we want to, for this? A little more detail. We kind of talked about the different things that we would do. Is there a certain build you would put together for it? Uh, like with the background and stuff, I would do this as a. Don't all look at me. Um, <laughs> Staring you down. <laughs> okay, this is how I would do this. I would go UNT Paladin, but I would do no Vengeance Paladin, but I would give it something like a like I never look at the mechanics of this stuff. I just look what would be fun. But I do it as something like an Outlander or like a Hermit or something where they're like separated from society. Um, I'm not interested in mechanics or this stuff. I'm interested in what I think is going to make an interesting character. And uh, basically, do you know what? How I'll build this character with that back with that build that I've just said there as like the creepy old dude in Home Alone that ends up being the useful, but everybody's terrified of him and nobody wants anything to do with him because they assume that he's a crazy person. Mm. And that's how I would build this paladin. That at the end of it all, you're like, you were actually very helpful, and they were like, yeah, just because I'm a bit goth. Does it mean that I'm a bad person? A bit gone. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, I thought of an idea of like playing a Yuan T that was kind of like a Mad Max from the desert style. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, play with like the the warlock side of things, but like the necromancer side. So mm -hmm. to build off of that, but I I imagine that they've survived and lived within a desert because they're reptilian. They can they can do that. Sure. Um, but yeah, became separated from its clan and has decided to go on its own or got banished or something like that. Yeah. And is now just mad maxing and destroying anything that in its wake, basically. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I just like angry characters. So that's how I roll. Fair. I love it. Could they rattle? Could this Yuan T, you know, like a rattlesnake? Can we make it a rattlesnake? Can maybe that'd be a bit, that? maybe that's a you bit druidy. You could probably just do it if you... Because they do have polymorph it, I believe, a later level. But if they're like a druid or something, you could have like a yeah, staff. Yeah, you could just have a staff rattles. that rattles, yeah. or you could upgrade yourself to a different level and yeah. have a rattle. Like if Rafiki was a um, Yuan T. I, I randomly pictured Rafiki as well with his fucking cane. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anything you guys want to add about Yuan T? I have a class. You have a class? Oh, you've got one. Yeah. Tell me. Just trying to remember how to pronounce. There we go. I've been playing a lot of WoW, so I've just been thinking of Astrologian when I was trying to remember. Of not WoW, um, Final Fantasy oh, wow. instead of Artificer. Oh, yeah, we talked about this. So Please I don't would confuse do... World of Warcraft I know. and Final Fantasy. World of Warcraft is a bad game right now. They're different. Very different games. So I would do a uh, multi class. Mm -hmm. And similar idea of them being lost in the desert. So start with uh, two levels of Assassin Rogue. And then go into Artificer. So you had to sneak around the desert. You have to steal from trading camps and uh, caravans going across the desert for several years to survive. That's where you get your rogue from. And then someone catches them and brings them in and trains them in the ways of an Artificer. So nothing that would work for their mechanics, but I think it'd just be a really interesting and fairly difficult like roleplay build. I feel like none of us care about mechanics when we're doing these. I think no. So. <laughs> I never. This is the one time I don't care about mechanics. Yeah. I, I'm really not mechanics heavy. I'll be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do like a tiefling cleric, and everyone's like, why? That doesn't work for these reasons. I'm like, fuck, dude. It will sorry. work for me. Yeah, it'll work for me it. because I have this one joke which I'll get done. 
in session one, and then I'll be stuck with this character for well. the rest of the time. But why? Why did you? Why artificer? Because you were gonna, um, or artificer, as we say in my country. I just haven't played the class mainly. Okay. And it seems I feel like, like you're really gonna get more details. You went nope. and someone brings it I've in. I've got like an nothing fun around. with it. I think an artificer would be traveling between place and place because you're not gonna sell potions forever in one small town. You're gonna mm-hmm. want to go to a bunch. So obviously, that's why they'd be on the road and. I could see them seeing, knowing what a Yanti is, because they're fairly eclectic in their knowledge, and being able to use one particularly well without alienating them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they are fairly alienated, depending on what lore you go with, from what I was reading. So. I like that. Yeah. It's very cute. I do like the idea of them being tinkerers as well. Mm-hmm. So, like, when you said an artificer, <laughs> artificer, I was then thinking, like, tinkerer, like someone that yeah. just collects things as they travel. You and collect your shiny things, and and especially because you've been lost in the desert. You just kind of, shiny gear. You I've stolen it. This is something that I could sell to someone to make a dollar for a bread. That fits into my Mad Max theory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Yeah. Just starts building its own, like, motorcycle. Yeah, you can just Son use the stuff from a, a Vernus <laughs> as a replacement just for stats. Yeah. Feel it. Oh, I like it. I'm going to make a note for myself for later. You want to use motorcycle. Does that make sense? <laughs> it will. <laughs> it will to me. Okay, so now comes the time in every single episode where we break to what we like to call a commercial um, but it's really just us pimping our own shit, and it makes Dan very uncomfortable to have to eat shit like this uh, when we ask you guys to do stuff for us. But we love you, and we love doing this podcast, but it is not freaking cheap. And I'm going to break the fourth wall, and I'm going to pull it back, and I'm going to say, guys, we could use the help. We are a struggling little podcast doing our own thing, and it comes entirely out of uh, our pockets. And we got to buy books to review them and to have be up to date on the regular stuff. We have to subscribe to D&D Beyond, and of course, there's the web hosting and, and paying Podbean and, and everything else. So we're asking, please, if you can find it in your hearts to kick a little bit in our direction. We are doing everything in our power to release as many different shows and episodes as we can. But it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of love, and a lot of money. And to be completely honest, we have the setup here that we've had for about a year and a half now. And and if we could all get better mics, that this would be, would be a better show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, scripts and jokes out the window, guys. This is a bit of a passion project. And we don't have a Kickstarter. We don't have a Patreon. We do have a donate button on the website. And we do have a store with, you know, we're selling a lot of stickers these days. Which we are. Is, yeah. Which is interesting. But they're only a buck fifty a piece. So it only goes so far. <laughs> and we only get a cut of that. So. As a balding man, buy more hats. <laughs> Anyways, please and thank you for whatever you can kick our way. If you don't, just know that your clicks and your listens feed our our love and our passion as well. So thank you for everything that you do, even just by showing up and listening. Uh, if you have any more that you can throw our way, we would be more than more than grateful. All right, um, I believe I am next, and I'm going to go over cobalts. Which is not surprising that Adam gave me that one. So. <laughs> not for me, that one. <laughs> no way. Nothing yeah. small. All right. So as we know, cobalts are a small love of mine. Um, as if we do believe that it can add a lot to gameplay from a DM perspective, but obviously that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about how much fun these little dragons can be as a player. So first, I'm going to give a little bit of basic knowledge because we do go through these in a couple of different episodes. So just some basics here. Um, kobolds are often dismissed due to their small size as well as their limited intelligence. However, they are a very devout community that believe in pack tactics and believe wholeheartedly in their, you know, religious, like they, 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 their beliefs are very religious based. Like they just, they worship or love whatever it is that they are told to worship and love, which is what I find very adorable about them. <laughs> they tend to live fast and not long. So despite having a 120 year long lifespan, Due to their tunneling and scavenging and adventurous nature, they are adults at age six and due to being very accident prone, die by age 20. But they can, but it's they possible could, for them to live to 100, 120 years old. Then you've got to have an NPC in there somewhere that's over 100 years old, Cobalt. You've got to make it work for some reason. <laughs> right. Or do they just think they're over 100 years old because no one's lived that long? Yeah, like they're 30 and they're Yeah, like, they're 30, oh, but this is 100 to them. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if they know that they can live to 120. Maybe one or like, two of them. That's, what a, what a, I, who found that out, that they could live to a 120? A gold dragon. 
Guaranteed. Yeah. A dragon had one in a cage. She said, and just, just study him. him. Yeah. See how long, See how long it can this last. Guy goes for. Yeah. Probably did it with, that's how we know how all the races can live that long. Yeah. Just one of the dragons it. just kidnapped races and like, when will you die? Yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking of dragons, spiritually, kobolds do have a strong belief that they are created directly from Tiamat and are raised to be uh, very prideful from where they came from. So they do worship dragons. That's one of their main things is they, if they are born into a clan, usually it is, I worship said dragon of some beholder or what have you. Sure. So, and because of this, they also don't have any fear of arcane magic. And in fact, they embrace it to the point of religious servitude. So they strive to have magic capabilities. They worship those that have magic capabilities and they do not have any fear of it whatsoever. Also, fun fact, they're omnivores. They can eat pretty much anything. So you would think that being a tiny little dragon creature, they would only want to eat meats. Nope, they eat everything. Really? Literally everything. Can they eat dairy? (laughs) No, that Can makes you... sense to me because they usually worship dragons and they eat the scraps. Do, yeah. do they die before dairy starts to bother them? Which is like <laughs> mid to late 20s. Before they have to go gluten free, before they have to go dairy free. That's before right. They have, yes, they can eat anything at yeah. that point. Uh, but because of this, they do tend to shed their teeth and their skin. So they, in fact, sometimes wear their teeth as jewelry. And, sure. Because why not? Fair. I can imagine it would be like a gift they would give to a kobold who is their friend to be like, hey man, here's some of my teeth. A sign okay. of friendship. That's like. <laughs> That's like when you're in school and there's one kid that starts doing something really, really weird because obviously they're just trying to express themselves and stand out. And you feel like you want to go up to them and go, look, I know what you're doing. I know, I get it. I get it. You're trying to stand out. You're trying to do a thing. Don't do that. Don't wear your own teeth. I promise you. You're not going to. Looking back <laughs> now, 20 look. years, I know what you're doing. I get it. I get it. I get it. But don't wear your own teeth. And that's yeah. what I feel like I would say to this cobalt. But they don't live long enough to know. They, oh, they, they'll never have to deal with the repercussions. Yeah. Of their own actions, like, no. Are you come to the high school reunion remembering the teeth? No, I'm not. Because I know <laughs> the pictures are you that. Yeah. Now I want to see the Cobalt 20-year reunion and see who shows up. One guy. <laughs> One guy. <laughs> One, maybe two. <laughs> oh, my God. Put that into a game, a Cobalt reunion. <laughs> the 20-year Cobalt reunion. Do it in a long campaign and do it in the background. Yeah. So your players never particularly encounter it, but every single year when the year rolls around in their game, at some pub they're at, there's a bunch of kobolds and the numbers just dwindle. There's like every a there's time. like a twenty year union behind yeah. in the background. There's just one guy crying into his drink. There's that one kobold bard hanging out in the corner <laughs> just yeah. singing his music because his band made it big last <laughs> yeah. year. Exactly. Oh. And he's not getting a down payment back either. <laughs> no. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Um, speaking of their social lights and their social capabilities, they hate gnomes. So, because apparently, (laughs) (laughs) some one time, the gnome god trapped the kobold god in a maze, and they never got over it. Jesus Christ. Um, But this also means that they tend to hold grudges. So, it's hard for For them to just get over stuff. Because, and it's weird, because if they are slated by a certain person, they will hate that race. Well, there's a lesson to be learned here. (laughs) Surely there's a lesson to be learned here. There is a lesson in here. So basically, if... If a human bothers them, they will hate all humans. Okay. So, <laughs> same, <laughs> same <seats? laughs> That one time Jeff did that one thing. Yeah, and now did I that one all thing. Jeffs. Now I, all Jeffs, <laughs> all Jeffs are done. Hey, some names do. I'm not picking on Jeff's name in particular here, but that does happen with names. Oh yes, right. Yeah. Like, there are some names I refuse to. I can't do Kimberly with. anymore. Fuck you, Kimberly. Like, yeah, there's just, at least one name where like no. What about Kim? Uh, I feel like I'm coming back out of this because this was when I was very young and uh. like now it's like 25 years later. You know, I'm kind of getting over it. But like it's weird how it sticks with you for a little yeah. while. It's yeah. true. It's true. It's true. But uh, they are, however, friendly with each other. So kobolds can be friends. Kobolds from other clans and other tribes, they can be friends. However, if one has the monopoly of a resource, they will fight over that resource. Okay. So wars can be waged, rate waged, can be raged between kobold tribes over resources and what like what what would they consider to be an important enough resource to go to war over? food treasure okay. gold oh like legit resources yeah no, okay yeah i thought it'd be a weird cobalt thing not just like i mean you could do like the largest thing. rock in the land you know what i would not it would not surprise me if they were fought over the largest rock in and the land. all of the original kobolds that went to war have now all died and it's the ones that have been the newer ones mm-hmm. they're still fighting this war and nobody can remember what it's over no and one side gets the adventure party involved. Yeah. And the adventure party levels the rock. Yeah. And it's just like a rock that's... It's just a, yeah, it's just a it's boulder. It's just a big boulder it's in the middle even, of a field. It's nothing yeah. special. 
Yeah. This is true. Uh, Barbarian got really mad, picked up the boulder and threw it. <laughs> and then all the kobolds were like, the fuck, my guy? So if you like the one-shot idea we've made over the course of this episode to throw it at him and Dan. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we're building something. Here. Yeah. Um, but as a playable race, you do get a dexterity score of plus two. Um, other than that, you have a basic speed of 30, which is not very exciting. You do get dark vision, which does make sense. They are tunnelers. They are excavators, that kind of thing. They have grovel, cower, and beg. <laughs> which is basically as an action on your turn, you can pathetically um, distract your foes with your sadness. Grovel, cower, and beg. <laughs> That's the name of my sex tape. <laughs> Uh, they do have pack tactics, so you do get advantage on attack rolls um, against a creature if at least one of your allies is within five feet of you. It doesn't have to be a fellow kobold, and from what it says, so I understand. <laughs> yeah, as pack tactics work, it's, I think it's just whoever is your ally. Yeah, yeah. They do have sunlight sensitivity, which sucks. Hmm. Yeah, because when Makes I was it looking at to play. yeah, when I was looking at builds, I'm like everything sucks because you have sunlight sensitivity. One of those big sun hats. I say sun hat, constantly wearing shades. Like yeah, yeah. It's not great. And uh, yeah, how does the sunlight sensitivity work? Is it just sore on your eyes or does it like hurt yeah. your skin? You get disadvantage on attack rolls, first off. That yeah, fucking I mean... sucks. And then on wisdom or any kind of perception check. Anything that involves sight. Okay, so it's just hurting your eyes. So yeah. a pair of sunglasses should mitigate it. Yeah, pretty okay. much. I, I mean, I, you would have to argue with your DM about yes. that. Yes. Yeah. And be like, you are outside. And say, yeah. yes, but and I'm it's... wearing my sunglasses at night And it's d well. Yes, I will always wear my sunglasses. <laughs> it's D&D, so you're going to have to craft two stained glass monocles, and that's the only way that you're going to pull this off. It's you the, have to hold no them at all times. <laughs> you can use an artificer to make one for you. Try to fight. That's where I if you make a yeah the a tinkerer or yeah, artificer yeah. will just put some yeah the tinker artificer Yanti yeah. will make you some glasses Throw that together for yeah. you yeah yeah cool little look at glasses. the party we're making I feel like we're making yeah we're definitely <laughs> making a party at a campaign and someone's gonna have to run it oh my god poor Adam <clears throat> poor sir all right dice and questions sure five now eight fifteen nine all right so. What's one interesting reason why one of these creatures would become an adventurer? Um, why would a kobold become an adventurer? Sent out by the rest of the tribe to look for resources. Mm. I think that'd be a fun way to do it, and I would heavily lean into the grovel and bag. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very cute. Uh, at 31 years old, he's the tribal elder <laughs> and stands the most chance of convincing whatever evildoers to spare their tribe. Yeah. To, or to share the the kobolds. No, the kobolds believe that the tribal elder of thirty one has to go and uh, share their wisdom with the rest of the world, or something like that. That's the way. I do. There are no knowledges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. them. When I've played in a kobold specific campaign where we were all supposed to play kobolds that were worshippers of said dragon, and to sent us out to go get resources. So it was us going out and finding an adventurer party and mm -hmm. taking their shit. Yeah. And it was a hoot because we did play into the beg. Yeah. And then, don't hurt me, I'm just a small <laughs> lizard folk. <laughs> so you oh, so you had to go out and find an adventure party and then try and gather resources, take their shit, beg, borrow, steal, whatever you can to bring it back. That would be so funny. Yeah. yeah. And it was a one-shot It was a one shot that we played in the middle of a longer campaign, and then we found out about halfway through this one shot that it was our party we were stealing from. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah it that's really a good cute. one. So I that's enjoyed awesome. it. That's awesome. We gotta do that for the Christmas episode or something. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be fun. They'd be like, they'd be like little kobold elves, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just taking... <laughs> taking resources to build the toys and stuff. Yeah. For Santa Dragon. I like it. Santa's an eldritch horror. <laughs> <laughs> I, sorry, eldritch horror? Both. Okay. <laughs> uh, what kind of insights do you have for a player who wants to explore the role-playing side of this? So we did talk about playing into the beg mm -hmm. and being scared, but is there anything else you guys would want to play into? Yeah, this? it's okay to be shit. Like, this is not a superhero character. Know your place within your the party, but enjoy that place. No one's looking to you like, come on, Kobold, you're supposed to be the hero. Like, you're going to have things that you're good at, right? But just enjoy your enjoy your role. It's okay that you're kind of the crappy one that has to beg and grovel and, and steal stuff. Just lean into that. It's not, No one's judging you. Nobody thinks you're shit in real life because you're trying to have fun playing a Kobold. It's fine. I'm imagining the first interaction where they have to come up to, like, a weird, hard discussion to have with, like, a, someone's, like a guard that you can't get past. And yeah. Kobold's like, hold up, guys. I I'll have this. A walks up oh my god please let us buy <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, just like oh my god just puts a don't do ugly crying face don't do ugly crying, <laughs> ugly crying. 
crying is not cute. <laughs> what about you, James? Any advice for role playing? Similar to Terry of how like kind of lean into your role, but I would do it as you're not going to be playing the main character. You're the main character's kind of dopey best friend. Yeah. You're funny. You're useful in what you're good at. You're LeFou. But other than that, you're not in charge. You're there to have a time and protect your buddy. That's kind of the role I would play. Yeah. I, yeah, I would definitely play into the, the scavenging side of it, too. Yeah. So, like, you, you like your resources. So, your role in the party can just be the person who goes and finds the food, goes and finds the water, goes and finds, like, digs tunnels so that you can get into different places where you wouldn't have been able to before. Like, yeah. you are a very useful tool as a kobold. Yeah. And if you're the DM, I think you would lean in. So, when they're doing their role to see what they can scavenge, give them, like, really interesting things and then... Like, so when they go back and they're like, where did you find this? And they're like, I don't know. Like, they just, they just find things. Have a bag of things. Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, as a kobold too, as the DM, I'd give them more options. So when they're looking around to, let's say, find water skins in the local inn to buy them or whatever, they'll also find a really shiny spoon. Yeah. So, like, stuff like that that may not be useful, but as a DM, you could plan it to be useful. But this yeah. is a cobalt. They don't necessarily know what is more important than the other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're like, I like the spoon. I brought the spoon. And then yeah. have that spoon be useful down the line where the cobalt's like, wait, I have a spoon. So they're more open-minded yeah. to, uh, to, the party's more open-minded to receiving those things. Just like, random. Like they're taking the yeah. lid off like a serving plate, but that covers the blowhole for the dots so everybody can get through. Exactly. Like just little random things and let them, like, here, you can choose what you came for or this shiny thing yeah yeah absolutely um adam started doing this really cool thing um where whenever we do scavenge and find like treasure chests he'll roll on like the weird common item list Mm -hmm. and so we'll find random items like you found a wicker basket perfect and like other like a clay pot and we're like how great for us (laughs) yeah (laughs) i got a clay pot once and i kept it the whole campaign yeah you're like this is a great like this is gonna be useful (laughs) i'm convinced it's going to be useful one day yeah but i think that's a good thing to do with your kobold like if you don't want to have to come up with items all the time if you do end up with a kobold at your table that's just randomly finding shit yeah just use the tables and roll on them. Exactly. Know the player They'll find too, it exciting. And just remember it, that they have that as the DM, and then just break, find some way to bring it in later. It doesn't need to be a big, huge, obvious thing, mm-hmm. but uh, bring it in. It'll Even, be, yeah, the wicker basket. Point. They're walking into a town, and someone drops a handful of flowers. So, here, I have a wicker basket. Yeah. yeah. And that, then, exactly. either that's the end of it right there, you kind of just had a random interaction, or that person you helped works at the inn you were going to, and they actually do have the rooms for your party. Yeah. So just have that cascade of decisions, yeah. which will force the party to do more things roleplay-wise. Makes that uh, character useful as well. Love it. Uh, what class or subclass would be good thematic fit for this, for a kobold? Okay, I'm going, I'm going wizard. With this, and probably some, and the reason I'm going wizard is because now I'm determined to get them to long life, and so probably eventually to lich them. Even though I do think that's like a cop out for wizards to always be looking for that, but it's the idea of trying to chase long life, and I feel like uh, doing something like a conjurer or something uh, would be really fun because they're so. Um, because they're truly fascinated with things, right? Because they worship dragons and they love the arcane because to them, even though it's amazing to regular people, it's incredible to them. So to have like the little kobold that could, that went out and studied magic and learned to conjure things and is seeking long life, um, I think that would be a lot of fun to play. And now lives forever. I love it. Alone. Alone. (laughs) I would either do a bard to lean into the charisma groveling and kind of laying it on thick with the deception or um, persuasion Mm -hmm. or i think it would also be fun to do like a druid and you kind of just wandered off one day yeah Uh, you were kind of looking at a flower and you saw like a really cool bee so you followed the bee and now you don't know where you are but there's an adventuring party so you grovel and get yourself ingratiated with them. Oh my god, I just really imagine being an adventuring party and all of a sudden a kobold walks up. I was just following bees. Yeah. yeah. Did you see the bee? Yeah. What? Yeah. The bee. Well, I'm going to stay with you guys now. Yeah. That you just <laughs> have a forever. kobold. <laughs> That's always the way the best NPCs get involved. Yeah. I was thinking druid, but I would want them to have like a were rat mount. Yes. Yeah. Just to, like, I just have just... Just a small creature on another. That small they creature. worship as well. That they th- not worship, worship, but like love, adore is a yeah. better word for it. Adore. Like they think, and it's just the most disgusting thing ever. Everybody <laughs> hates it. 
Everybody hates scabbers or choose your name. Yeah, you know? just gross, hairless rat. Just this is my best friend. Oh god. Oh. Uh, any details about creative builds that you can think for a lovely kobold? Okay, so creative builds. I like to flip things, okay? So I, I always, I, I, this isn't just a desperate attempt to escape the tropes, but it's like whatever is seen as typical. I won't try and flip it to be necessarily completely opposite, but just try and go down a different line. So for the example I just give there where it's like, okay, we know that they have the ability to be, have long life, but they typically die young. So put them in a position where they may have the chance to 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 reach that sort of long life. We know that they're grovelers, beggars, and borrowers, and stealers. So I'll try and find a way uh, to put them in a position where they're expected to be brave, like make them a paladin where they're expected to be brave yeah. but really it's not really it's just that a, a god did a good thing for them one time so they swore allegiance to this god not understanding the responsibility that they've now taken on for themselves so you have like a cowardly paladin i love that yeah, yeah. right just constantly like stepping a across its comfort zone on a regular basis yeah oh but the helmet right so the helmet goes on bonk comes down but inside they're going okay okay Okay. You got this. Just like themselves. Up. Half an hour and it's over. We got this. Well, you, exactly. <laughs> but you can only just hear it from the inside. Is he okay? Is everything okay there? I'm fine. I'm yeah, good. We yeah. got this. Yeah. Because you look like you're crying. That's all. <laughs> I would probably do a cleric, probably a death cleric, similar to how they kind of just agreed to something they didn't know they were agreeing to. Mm -hmm. Like they started following a subjugation party from the church with paladins, clerics, and everything. Just because or they use them to guide them through the mountain or whatever and he kind of just joined them and then kind of enjoyed what they were doing with their prayers yeah kind of just mimicked them and was given power yeah not entirely sure what they do with it not entirely sure how they do what they do but they have these things and they're not even able to read their spell book is what I would do. They just innately know their spells. And that puts it But the they pretend to read yeah, it. Yeah, they all pretend the time. they open it up, they pretend to prepare it every day, but they don't. They just kinda get lucky just with the pronunciation. Speak minion language. Yeah, they just kind of speak it sounds like they always cast in draconic, so <laughs> yeah. If no someone knows draconic, it's like, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, heal! It's yeah, yeah. it's basically like button bashing, right? On video, like, yeah. like like Mortal Kombat, like you learn three moves and they keep <laughs> you coming just bash up all those the buttons and occasionally get a well, random god, combo. It works out well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh my god, um, I like the idea of building a barbarian again, not from a mechanical standpoint, because uh, it doesn't make any sense because they technically have like a negative <laughs> strength. But I think it would be really cute that he got kicked out of his tribe because he had a rage problem. Like the, flash anger. Yeah, really want, but it comes from a stem of wanting to be really good at everything. Mm. Because, like, everyone has a reason, everyone has a purpose within the tribe, and they couldn't find their purpose, so it would frustrate them, and they would try to do all these different jobs within their tribe, but wasn't very good at anything, and everybody kept making fun of them, oh. so they would just get, so the, the rage just built yeah. up. Yeah, right. And then because they started destroying things out of a rage, got kicked out of the tribe because they were more like. That's when it would be fun to play with a friend also playing a kobold from the same village, but who's a bard. So they have jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of good at everything. Yeah. So that's what that was their inciting factor to go into their rage. But their friend follows them when they get kicked out. Like, kind of my fault. So mm -hmm. let's go together. Or doesn't know it's their fault. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're leaving, man? Let's thinks go. Thinks they're being helpful all the time. Being like, don't worry, man. I got you. I'll yeah. help you with that. I can absolutely help you. That's like, fuck off, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God damn it, Jack. <laughs> What about like a, leaning into that, like a kobold that keeps getting passed from adventure party to adventure party, like they're trying, when you come across other adventurers, there's this kobold and they're just trying to palm this kobold oh off God. onto you. <laughs> like it's just like leave in the middle of the oh. night or something. The kobold is still here and he's just like going through the bags of fucking stuff. Well, well he's got to stay with us. He's going to die. Like, <laughs> he has the spoons. <laughs> he has all the spoons. <laughs> Two towns later, you're trying to drop him off at the inn or something. Like, oh my God, he's so cute. You should spend the whole afternoon with him. Oh my goodness. Adorable. Okay, I'm going last, and I have lizard folk. I've never actually explored lizard folk too much because I all tend to judge books by their cover too much, and I thought they'd seem kind of boring, and I didn't think there was going to be much to them. But I actually was uh, was quite interested when I took a little deeper dive here. So a little bit of uh, on the lore, but I won't go into too many details. Uh, I think what's important to note is while lizard folk are humanoid. They, they do have more in common with reptiles than humans in that their mind is alien to ours. They're driven by a different set of basic principles and values, if you would even call them values. Their feelings revolve around fear, aggression, 
and pleasure. So when presented with a situation, they would not think, for example, I'm scared. They would think avoid this thing, which is, is different. It means that the sense of um, compassion or bravery isn't necessarily there. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they're, they're operating with a different mind. So for example, um, this, a, a lizard folk is not likely to get angry, but they may suddenly get aggressive if they feel threatened. So that idea of when you're looking into reptiles and you do not know what they're thinking and they're staring back at you and you don't know if they're happy, if they're sad, or if you're about to die or what, I think that should be present all the time. And they suddenly lick their eyeball and you don't know if they're being <laughs> cute or aggressive. <laughs> exactly like that. Exactly like that. And they will they will do things or feel the need to do things for different reasons to you. So James, for example, if you were to die next to me and I was a lizard folk, my mind would go, oh, that is now food and I need food. I should eat you. But they may recognize that if I do that, it might upset Megan. So they won't do it. But not because Megan is upset, not out of compassion, because if I do that and Megan gets upset, she may then get aggressive, which may then be a threat to me. Do you see what I'm saying? So they okay. think they think differently. So you have to you have to understand that when you're role playing these characters, um, that uh, you know if it's they're not going to dive through the fire to rescue the person that's supposed to be their friend because that may kill them and that's not good. Now everything else is going to die, right? So it'll come across as quite cold, but I don't think it's cold because it's not malicious. It's just that they think differently. Uh, and and so, like to add on to that, it's the idea that uh, everything is fine. You're a good person if you've got a roof over your head. You're a good person if you've got a belly full of food. And you're a good person if everything is, is going well and you have everything that you need. Uh, but if you've grown up in a swamp like a lizard folk where there's constant threats everywhere all the time, your view and how you evolve in the world is going to be very different to, uh, to humanoids. Yeah. So their relationships with other races, uh, one of the more interesting parts about this is that they actually feel pity for other humanoids. Look at us. We are pathetic. They are giant armored dragon people, lizard people that have claws coming out of them uh, where they're very, they're very hardy and uh, they can, they're able to withstand threats in the world. And we are probably pathetic in their eyes. That seems pretty common with these, at least these lizard races, right. the looking down on squishy humans. Yeah, and I don't know if it's looking down upon as like, oh my god, you're pathetic, but more that's like... Yanti is definitely because you Now that's why they would be different, because Yanti is like, it is seeing them as being... As lesser. Like, right, as being lesser. Yeah. This is, how do they defend themselves? I don't understand it. Like, sure, I may need to stay with them, because if there's a threat, they will die. You know, um, it's kind of a, it's kind of looking at it like that. Um, so they don't mourn fallen comrades, or they don't rage against their enemies. Uh, they're they're just instinctual, and they're in the moment. And so for that reason, they don't necessarily have a long view. They don't have a five year plan or a ten year plan. They're very much living in the present. What do I need to survive right now, and uh, what do I need to get through the next day tomorrow? But when you're kind of squishier like us, we have a long view, right? We need houses. We need shelter. We need to make sure that we have enough food to get through the winter. They know they're going to be all right tomorrow. So it's, you know, they know they have the ability to survive. So they don't think of the long, uh, the long view like that. Hmm. Uh, when it comes to religion, most lizard folk worship Semuanya. Semuanya? Semu sure. The wrong people here to get this one. Yeah. Dan Semuanya? <laughs> 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 who's focused solely on the survival and the propagation of, li of the lizard folk species. And this religion uh, is maintained by clerics who serve as tribal shamans and they bestow Semuanya's blessings on the lizard folk people uh, whenever it's required. Although they have no shrines or temples and nor even regular ceremonies, lizard folk were very proud of their religious traditions and they do see themselves as being very close to nature. Hmm. Hmm. You're saying their god is mainly for their race to propagate, essentially. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. very different from most gods in D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. They most want something from you, even the good ones. Yeah, yeah. Sem Semuanya hmm. is a, a very uncaring and unfeeling god who dismissed even the suffering of his followers, expecting them to take care of themselves. <laughs> Makes sense. You got this. Just, yeah. yeah. As a race, they treat each other like that, so of course their god would. Yeah, yeah. so for that reason, many lizard folk actually shift to just sort of worshipping nature themselves and so that's why they do very well to kind of uh, play like druids and uh, maybe even a ranger or something like that as well okay so when it comes to uh, racial bonuses and mechanics something that's good to, to note is that uh, they're uh, they get plus two to con plus one to wisdom they get a bite attack as well which is 1d6 plus your strength hmm. uh, they get cunning artisan which means they can make items shields clubs javelins darts needles from fallen beasts constructs dragons monstrosities or plant creatures and they can do that over a short rest hmm. They can hold their breath for 15 minutes. 
This for me is hugely tactical when it comes to combat. Because do you know what else yeah. can't hold their breath for 15 minutes? Everything else cannot hold their breath turtles for 15 can. minutes. Turtles can. Okay, so if you're as long as you're not fighting a turtle, you're Almost right. you come as shit. <laughs> Uh, they get uh, Hunter's Law, which means they're proficient with uh, any two of animal handling, nature, perception, stealth, and survival. They get Natural Armor, which is basically 13 plus their Dex modifier. And they get Hungry Jaws. Uh, as a bonus action, they can bite. If it hits, it causes normal damage, and they gain temporary hit points equal to their Con modifier. This resets on a short or a long rest. Vampires. Yeah, essentially. Um, so when it comes to like some insights on, on about role-playing this race, I would have it that in every scenario, you have to think about preservation over sentiment so your role is to keep yourself and others alive it's not to align with their squishy views on compassion or their religions or or whether you know and i kind of imagine that scene in a uh, i robot to go all the way back there you know when he's talking about how the robot doesn't know that it, the 11 percent chance that the, that the child would survive is better than the 16 percent chance that the adult would survive like he would know mm -hmm. to make the choice that would be the same for the lizard folk i think they would assess it on who is more likely to survive and they would choose the what we would consider to be the wrong person based yeah. on that they don't really care about the greater good or yeah. any of that the nonsense. morality of it is just no, it's, the mechanics yeah. it's, mathematics yeah it's surviving it. the day yeah. right it's not your yeah who would be more thing. useful to survive if we needed to lose one person yeah and they would they, yeah. and it says as part of the law as well they will typically observe what others do to kind of blend in but this will, it's difficult for them to, to register. So they'll maybe kind of uh, just find one trait about humans, for example, and just stick with that, which means that sometimes they'll just laugh after something awful has happened because that's quite often the reaction that they see humans do about other things, right? <laughs> so someone can die in front of them, ha, 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 and they're like, nope, all right, okay, next one. <laughs> <laughs> Try it next time, excellent. That's me, Megan. That's it? That's all you got? Uh, yeah, uh, that's it. Now I'm on, Now I'm ready for your questions. Whatever right. you throw them at me. Roll dice and last questions. Okay. I've been getting fives, I think, mostly. 17. 17. 15. 15 12. 12. Okay. All right. First question. What is an interesting reason why a lizard folk would become an adventurer? Yeah, I feel like um, for whatever reason, they're leaning into the fact that they think that they're the only reason that these people around them can survive. They can, the only reason that they can survive the day. Now, I don't have the, the the reason why that may be bestowed upon them. It may just be that they're commanded to do that or there's something from nature, from their God, where they feel that they need to do it. But I think that they recognize that the other people within the party are pathetic and without them, they will surely die. And so they must be there to protect them. Mm, I got you. Um, I do like the idea that they are told to go help someone. Mm -hmm. So like, same thing, they're part of a clan or they're part of a tribe and then a, a group of adventurers comes through and they need help doing something. And yeah. then like the leader is like, Hey, you need to go help them. And they're like, I don't want to. It's yeah. Like, well, you, you have to because... And they just be like so bluntly honest all the time as well. Like yeah. just like to whoever like the gnome or, or whatever is in the party, they'll be like, when we go in there, it is most likely that you will die and it will be horrible for you. It'll be a horrible, horrible death for you. Yeah. And they'll be like, oh, like, are you going to help me? They'll be like, only if it's in the favor of everyone else. Otherwise, no. I can like, see them like walking up and being like, you're too short. You're going to be too tall. You can't fit through half the tunnels that we need to go through. That weapon that you're carrying, too heavy. You're going to drop it within like six, like three miles. I yeah. can understand what we're trying to do Just here, give guys. people percents of their death. Yeah. You have a 12% <laughs> chance of dying. You're 60% and I'm not going to help you. Yeah. 100% like <laughs> that. Every single encounter, you just give off a little percent to everyone and go into the fight with <laughs> no other reaction. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's like somebody loses an arm or something yeah. like that. And the rest of the fight, you know what it's like. It's happened in, a, in everybody's sort of game. And they're like... We should leave you behind because you are now useless. Yeah. And that's just cool. Or offer to eat it because it is food. Or just start eating like, it. Like, do you it's mind if I eat this? Just yes. throws it on the, on the fire. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even think they would ask if you mind because that's a human I thing, I think right? they would ask because they know the others and they react there you poorly. Go. That's right. They would probably, like, reach for the arm like, yeah. eh? Yeah. I'm gonna... Uh, yeah. Everyone, and then I'm just... <laughs> I would lean into, like, the sounds as well. Like, I imagine, like, when they... It's almost like when we salivate, like when a meal's coming, they would make that like velociraptor sound if someone's arm gets chopped off or something like that, and they see it, and they're, I'm sorry, oh, it just God. happens. Put the velociraptor kinda... sound on a soundboard, and so just, when you're playing, just hit it every so often. Just yeah, perfect. random clicking noises. Yeah, yeah. James, what about you? Any adventurer ideas? Um, uh, for me, I would have it that they believe someone in that adventure party 
will eventually be able to help their clan mm. through prophecy uh. or something. So they need to make sure that person doesn't die on that party's goal, whether it's to suppress the Mad King or right. stop the Cobal Uprising. They need to do that now because they know this person needs to come back eventually to their tribe to solve a problem. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I like that. Uh, we talked a little bit about the role-playing, but any other role-playing tips and tricks for lizard folk? Wait, 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 wait. I didn't write it down, but I do know. Yeah, role-playing tips and tricks is that you have to remember um, that while everything that we sounded there uh, said there seemed kind of cold, they're not evil. They're They're neutral. They're neutral, neutral. They don't understand the concept of, of good and evil. So whenever you're putting something across and it sounds cold, it shouldn't, it, it's cold as in it's unfeeling, not it's malicious. But this can be to everyone all of the time, always and should be. And it can be to different extents, uh, but uh, make sure you don't, don't cross to the point that you're being an, an asshole. It's not about being a dick. It's about being unfeeling. Yeah, on that same point, I think... Uh... One major thing, especially including the Yanti on this, stop thinking from a human perspective. Yeah. 100%. Like the Yanti don't have emotion. So you're not being malicious. And as the lizard folk, you're not being a malicious letting that party member die that's surrounded by five monsters at a low level that you know you can't take, even with their help. You wouldn't go into that situation in both cases. Mm -hmm. Not because you hate the person, not because you're evil. But because your life is at risk and it won't go out well for you, so yeah, and you would you actually weigh expect, the odds. You would expect that if the situation was reversed, the exact same, same thing, thing to happen. happen. You would yeah. expect them to ditch you and let you die on your own. You wouldn't expect to get helped there, so you wouldn't return that favor. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to think from a non-human perspective. Remember where your character's coming from. Yeah, not only have that like that non-human perspective, but always feel inclined that you have to have an opinion. <laughs> like I feel like this is the kind of character that you could be you could have an opinion no matter what the opinion yes. is they would say it yeah so I feel like don't be scared to say whatever the heck is on your mind if you're role playing I'd be careful with what party you're playing with. oh for sure but that's with most especially these more neutral classes know who you're playing with in our uh, evil campaign, I abandoned one of our players to die. Of course. And the player was quite upset about it. Oh. He thought it was malicious and it was what, like, I hated to say it, but it was what my character would do. It's you within lore, it's within <laughs> role to play, the best of us. Megan knows. But, <laughs> like, I should have thought <laughs> more that that character would be more upset, so I should have tried something just for cohesiveness of the party. Yeah. But, eh. Shit it's happens. also People die. It's also up to the DM to help that yeah. kind of situation out, right? Mm -hmm. Like if they if the DM saw that that was happening between two players, that's also uh, yeah. A and they weren't like, super okay, upset either. It was more of a out. why'd you abandon me? Well, here's what my character I'm would do. I'm just playing my guy. I'm yeah. just playing my character. <laughs> that, that I hate idea, saying that, I but. Know. The idea that you had, Megan, about always having an opinion, I think, could be useful sometimes as well. That's like when you're doing that those intense. Uh, role play kind of like puzzles, right? Where yeah. you're trying to convince people of what if something's happening, and then the lizard folk is just to whoever the person is that tries to act tough is is like you are visibly afraid, <laughs> and I can tell because of that. And then do your insight check, and then tell because I don't like when you do insight checks and it's like oh they're scared. It's like no, what's happening with their body? What would the lizard folk be able to pick up? What can he smell? Where's the sweat coming from them? And then uh, and then using the idea you had of your opinion and sharing it with them because I think. Uh, the, the lizard folk probably wouldn't be trying to intimidate. They don't try and intimidate. They just go from zero to 100. They just either, either decide that you're not going to die, and now you're going to die. So any opinion that they give is just an observation. Yeah. yeah. It's the it's the overshare. This is the yeah. Dan overshare character. Oh, yeah. This don't is be Dan. scared to overshare. <laughs> Oversharing Dan has overshared again. Sorry, Dan. That was the meanest <laughs> jingle ever. It's going to go in the commercial. Um... <laughs> Well, what's class or subclass would be a good theme and good fit for their, a lizard folk? Me, I'm going first, right? I think if I remember the initiative, right? Yeah. Do you know what I want? I had visions of um, of uh, like that hallway scene with Darth Vader, right? Because these they should be terrifying. They've grown up in awful conditions. Their body is prepared for war all the time, and they do not care about you. It's not that they don't care about you; they don't know what caring is. And so, I think something like a battle master where they are just pure ferocious in battle in that they can ambush, they can move you where they want to be, they can they can react to what you're doing. And the idea is that it's not that they've been trained by some general or something like that. It's that there are not enough hours in the day for you to be as proficient in combat 
as someone who's grown up in the worst conditions ever and is essentially a walk-in war machine. Mm-hmm. So that battle master, they, they, whatever you think you're going to do to escape the Komodo dragon is not going to work. Yeah. Um, I, I like the rogue side of things. Mm. Super quick, super fast, super sneaky, just like snick stick with their finger knives like just whole nine yards of just free to the, play into the freakiness of them mm-hmm. right i also like the idea of them just being super cloaked all the time like their their hood is up because they're trying to mask the fact that they have no emotion right so they're just trying to be like a part of the party but like they know that they're super awkward and quiet so they're going to lean into the fact that they're super awkward and quiet instead of trying to have too many conversations yeah i love it so. Especially if you had a kobold, like, for whatever reason, just, like, worship them or, like, a little sidekick next to them. And then <gasps> they kind of Im- imitated what they did. But the kobold just looks like E.T., you know, when you oh put my the God. thing. So it's like, the, it's like when uh, parents and their kids, like, wear the same, like, outfits and stuff. It would be the best. I feel like we've now completed the party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, James? For me, I'd probably do Monk. Yeah. That they've been out in the wilderness fighting and battling and killing things for so long. They've kind of just become zen about it. And it fits with their say what's on their mind and the way I kind of feel lizard folk are. Mm -hmm. That's very cute. Mm -hmm. I like that. All right. uh, Digging deep. Creative builds. Okay. Um, I went monk for my creative build. Son of a bitch. Well, I went (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the reason I went monk, and I did this, I did do this mechanically because I couldn't get over this uh, this uh, fifteen minutes that they can hold their breath for. And I thought I need something which is like an absolute bullet that has multiple attacks. They also have that bonus action bite attack where they yeah. drain. Where if they get hold of you, you're fucked, and you're going to be fucked in many different ways because they have a swim speed as well of thirty feet um, that I saw. So I thought something like a monk. Where they can get at you in half a second. All they need to do is grab you. You're not going anywhere. They have probably, I don't know how much movement because monk stuff, right? <laughs> monk stuff. If you get in, if they take you in the water and you are grappled, they can continue to attack you in the water. You can't get away and they can stay there for 15 minutes and you can't. So what this means is it, it doesn't matter how many minions there are. Whatever the big bad or the lieutenant or what is it you're dealing with that in that situation, as long as there's some sort of water around, which quite often there is in D&D, you can completely remove that threat so everybody else can deal with the minions on top and you just hold them there, drowning, and they won't be able to get away. And if they try and get away... I don't know what their swim speed is. Probably nothing. So they've got to do whatever bullshit they have to go to move in water. You're on them again the next turn. You also and you're taking monk them back shit that down. can paralyze them every That's single it. round. That's it. And I forgot to add that in. That's right. You can also stun them yeah. and then hold them underwater. Yeah, and just keep them down there and drown them out. And that to me is terrifying. Why that, is terrifying. that is very terrifying. I do like the idea too of um, the, the role playing aspect of how they speak. Their, mm-hmm. their speak their mind like we've been talking about but it comes out as like a zen mantra mm-hmm. it's like how you were saying to play into the zen part of it but it's just like instead of being like this is a stupid idea they're like are you sure that you want to do that mm. like the asking more que- like more of like the monk shit yeah 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 oh that calm, phrase that, you're dumb is a that question calm stillness yeah. of the monk where you think that they quite like you because they're lizard folk they don't show emotions especially because they're monks as well and then one time they're just like i might kill you tonight I think that your death is imminent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. How do you mean? I don't know. I just I don't feel, know, it. Man. feel it in my bones. <laughs> I'm not a clairvoyant, man. Come on. Um, I also went druid with this one. I thought monk as well, but mm. then I thought my build that I was thinking in my head fit more with a druid, the naturey side of things. However, they were taught at a very young age that the way they say things hurts people's feelings. So it was drained into their brain that the way they speak hurts people. And they don't like that. So basically they become a mute. They don't talk oh. anymore. So this is the exact opposite of everything we've ever talked about uh, when it comes to these guys, but they will draw pictures. Okay. Or they will like um, express things in some kind of an art form. So that's why I thought Druid would fit well with this because they could play into the nature side of things, breezes of wind or what have you to express some kind of an emotion. But when things go awry, suddenly they'll disappear. Or like if they're getting ready to go into battle, but no one else knows about it, suddenly like their battle cat will appear beside them, like oh shit, <laughs> like because they can they sense things happen almost before they happen. Right, right. So physically, what they're doing with their body would give away what's going on and how they're feeling, but they would mm. never actually speak, which I think would be very difficult but interesting to role play as a right. character. Right. Yeah, could be a good NPC, I think. Yeah, it would make a really good NPC to carry around on the party, but like as a playable character, it'd be very, very interesting to see mm-hmm. if someone could actually pull that off. 
it would take a very senior group and a senior play table to do something oh, like that. Yeah. But yeah. What about you, James? Uh, to add to that senior play table, wizard. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think uh, you'd have to play it very in that particular game's lore wise. As uh, the way I would do it, at least, is have the tribe you're from often attacks a wizard tower as a rite of passage to prove yourself as a strong warrior to go do chief things, whatever, something fairly uh, small group that can do. Like, Mm -hmm. not something everyone can do. That's why it's a hard task to do. And he attacks it with the wizard tower, doesn't succeed, but doesn't die like he normally does. And the wizard who stopped him trains him. So then instead of becoming the fighter or barbarian or whatever he was going to be, now he has magic. Mm. And what does he do with this magic when he goes back to his tribe? Or does he join an adventure party? Because he shouldn't go back to this tribe now overflowing with magic. Mm -hmm. Especially the way their emotions work. Yeah. I feel like they would be tasked to join an adventure party to explore something specific or find Mm -hmm. something specific. Or to your point, find the champion that's going to come save the clan or what have you. That fits well into that. I like that. Cool. Any final thoughts from anyone? Yeah, as a DM, I think, uh, I implore all DMs, I think you have a responsibility to find some way to uh, to put emotions into this lizard folk somewhere. Whether it's just like an item that they get or whatever, but some way in which this lizard folk, it's like, uh, to go all the way back to like Star Trek The Next Generation, Data had a brother, I forget his name, Lore, I think, something like that. And he had, he, but he had emotion, right? Mm-hmm. He could he could, he could could feel emotions. Because I think that's going to make for an interesting character arc of what happens with this lizard folk when they do understand what everybody else feels and what that means. What do they do with that? Do they enjoy it? Do they embrace it? Do they try and get rid of it? Do they do they fall in love? Do they what do, what happens when the lizard folk experiences tragedy for the first time? Because it would be an adult experiencing all of these raw emotions for the first time, and uh, I think that would be. Uh, interesting i don't know what would their love language be you know (laughs) what would what would their love language be acts of service obviously exactly (laughs) Mm, i think uh, co-play no (laughs) being in the same place as someone they care about but Mm. not i thought you said cold play (laughs) (laughs) that's a love language (laughs) cold play is a love language but that's a different one (laughs) depression All right, guys, any final inspirations about anything before we wrap up the episode? Don't be afraid to play a neutral character. Neutral's not copping out for no. taking an alignment. No. It can be if you're not going to do anything with it, but being a neutral character gives you so much more play space. Yeah. Because you can take more questionable actions without being an evil character yeah but you can also do the good thing for evil reasons yes yeah. you can challenge things you can have the uncomfortable conversations yeah you can be you can uh you can be awkward and uh yeah and you can challenge really your extreme party members yeah the ones exactly. that are the lawful good and the chaotic evil you can challenge them by just existing yeah that's right and just even acting neutrally that's a great point actually there james where you can challenge those people with more extreme behaviors because you're outright questioning why mm. they're doing something yeah which makes them kind of uh, voice that to the world and not because to like the lawful good and the chaotic evil they're diametrically opposed so they're just going to oppose each other you're neutral so why are you wanting to burn down this orphanage yeah. or why are you wanting to save this orphanage like what's the value in each point yeah mm. maybe we should have like a lizard folk therapist or something oh god but, oh, doesn't realize he's like a therapist he just lets people speak people just show up to the pub with him and just feed him drinks and he right. answers things for but, but he's genuinely asking because he's trying to understand yeah humanoids when he goes how does that make you feel mm-hmm. it's because he's trying to understand yeah, how it makes them emotions. feel what, and does, like, what does that emotion look like yeah for you? And they're like <laughs> Yeah. You know what, man? Oh, it's just God. so nice to be asked. Like, that's, it's so nice to be asked. I got all these emotions. I got this, this shit going on with my mom and stuff. Tell me more. My whole yeah, God. But it's, that's their genuine curiosity. Oh, my football friends passed away at 20. Like, yeah. I'm the last one. Of I'm the last one of the party. <laughs> Or kobolds. Um, and as I will always say, if you have kobolds or come across lizard folk or you want to eat, always talk to them before striking. I find I was yeah. always my warning for anyone that comes across them. Yes. They will have a story to tell. Make your DM have them a story to tell. Yep. They usually come in handy and they're usually able to convince to your side or at least not to instigate anything with them. Because mm-hmm. once again, they're all relatively neutral. 
Mm -hmm. So as long as you're not opposed to them, they're not generally opposed to you. Mm -hmm. They want to live just as yeah. long as you are. If longer, usually. Touche. All right, so that's all for our discussion on kobolds, lizard folk, and you want to eat pure bloods. The next time we circle back to discussing playable races, we'll be looking into the updates to Dragonborn that Fisbin's Treasury of Dragons brought to the table. Next week, we'll be returning to our conversation on druids and what DMs and players can look forward to from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Thanks for listening to another episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. If you'd like to support us, we have a donate button on our website, www.itsamimic.com, as well as a store for some sexy merch. We also rely on word of mouth to get news of the podcast out there to the community, so please pass the word to everyone you know that we're available on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as most podcast apps. Thanks again for listening to It's a Mimic, where you never know what you're going to get. This has been an It's a Mimic production. Inquiries, requests, and questions for our mailbags can be sent to info at itsamimic.com. For the lizard races we're talking about, or lizard adjacent, what would be your preferred player character? We're talking about kobolds, lizard folk, and yanti. So for you to play as a character... Oh, you oh, easy for me. Kobold. Really? 100%. Why Kobold? I just love Kobolds. I have since the I'm, beginning of time. I hate Kobolds. So be, I'd be a yuan T. Yeah, I'd one be One of the Yon pretty ones, too. not one of the ugly ones, James. I don't like ugly things in my D&D. The ugly ones are more powerful than the pretty <laughs> ones, though. I mean... It it's like when you have to mechanically. Your armor. In what way? Have you seen some of these Instagram people? Like, all the stuff that they're getting? They don't deserve it. Is the Instagram in the Forgotten Realms? No, but I think for that reason alone, I would want to go to the Forgotten Realms. I'd go Yuan T. You're going Cobalt. What are you? I would doing? probably do Yuan T as well. Okay, I yeah. played Yuan T in our evil campaign. Sat right together. next to me. Yeah. Oh, it was a good one. It's good times. What a bunch of nerds. This episode of the It's a Mimic podcast is going to crack open Volo's Guide to Monsters and see the fifth edition has to bring to the table when it comes to some of the reptilian and throw. Oh God damn it, anthro. Opomorph anthropomorphic? Anthropomorphic. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I'm glad someone else had to have that word explained to me. <laughs> and I knew the meaning behind that word as well. So I know the meaning, I just never have to use it in my regular speech. <laughs> Nobody says that. <laughs> Who uses this word? Anyways, okay. I'm gonna do that whole thing again, I'm sorry. Mom, go away. Thank you. <laughs> So how's everybody today? Oh. Thanks for listening. Bye.